I'd love to first start talking about a drama teacher that you talked about being um, colorblind. She didn't give me parts that were super racially specific. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't playing an African-American part in a, in a play about African-Americans in which the pain and struggle of African-Americans right. are really a big part of it and that you really want to um, not appropriate that experience. But she mm -hmm. gave me parts that were more neutral right. racially and should be more neutral and should be thought of as more neutral. Like I played the music man, okay? So I played the music man. Nobody cares what race the music man right. is, really. Could you just go a little more in depth with what that means to you, this idea of non-traditional casting? Traditional casting is very narrow-minded casting. Mm -hmm. Non-traditional casting is anything that takes out, uh, you know, takes you outside of that narrow box. Mm -hmm. And so that includes um, how abled people are. It depends, it has to do with their race, it has to do with their gender, it has to do with all kinds of things. And then opening that, those opportunities for other people. Free association, if I say doctor, you think of something in your mind, mm -hmm. you might, mm -hmm. you're a young person, so you, maybe you, you don't. <laughs> um, and, and, but, a lot of people do, mm -hmm. and the, the, the initial instinct is to push against that. I would love to kind of skip ahead a little bit into your career and talk about M. Butterfly. You won a Tony Award, you were the first Asian American to win a Tony Award for a featured actor. Looking back on that now, what do you think of about the importance of not only that role, but that award and what it's meant for the theatrical and entertainment community as a whole? While I always celebrate and I really, really am very proud of my involvement with that play and with David and, and with the production and everything that that role brought to me, I am mm -hmm. also grown rather cynical about mm -hmm. the long lastingness of those kinds of events. Can you go into that a little more? What do you mean well, by that? I had a tendency to think that when something groundbreaking happened, something was fixed. So how important do you think that concept is of just being seen and being able to give opportunities to people who maybe have not had these breaks yet that you have been able to have? Yeah, you know, I, thank you for bringing this up because this is the cycle of, um, of, of our inability to get out of our own bad habits mm. that crosses way outside of the entertainment industry. There was a time in the world when you would say, well, why don't you have more Asian people in your show? And they would say, well, there really aren't any, mm -hmm. or they're not good enough. Those two things are very dangerous right. ideas. They, they're, they're, there are plenty, and they are, many of them are young enough to just need the experience to be able to compete in a very competitive business. If you could just kind of sum up some points that you're gonna hit on um, in your speech, how would you kind of sum that up? There was a time in my life where I thought I was completely outside the argument or the mm. discussion of civil rights. Mm -hmm. Like that was for white people and black people mm. and that I wasn't involved in that. And now as the discussion of racial equality becomes more complex and more varied and more nuanced, you understand how the racism of one ra race of people affects and is, um, uh, uh, affects and is a, a part of mm -hmm. someone else's. I guess I'm prouder or more um, happier of the fact that I can participate in this discussion right. now right. and that I bring to it my experience as a person in an industry which highlights racism in a very weird way. Like you can, you can have discussions about racism at large when you start with a conversation about racism in, in the entertainment, 